Hello, how are you? Well, um, today I want to do a video about Melchizedek. I uh, mentioned Melchizedek in on one of my uh, in one of my German videos, and somebody asked about Melchizedek, and so um, try to find some of my videos that I made. <laughs> And I noticed that I did them about six years ago. That's when I did a research, some extensive research about Melchizedek. I will also add those videos on the description, in the description. It was more in depth. But today I want to just kind of do a summary of Melchizedek. Now, we don't find very much in the Bible about Melchizedek, so he is like a mystery. Well, we know a little bit. And I think you have to be able to think on your own as well, because we have so little information. We get more information, for instance, in Chasher, in the book of Chasher, and some people say, oh, that's not biblical, so we're not going to go by Chasher. But Chasher is absolutely a historical book. It was mentioned in the Bible, I believe, twice, one in Chronicles and once in Joshua. So you can do that research yourself. So in other words, they quoted him. So Cheshire, the book of Cheshire is pretty old if it was quoted in Joshua. But we find... Three times the information, Genesis, Psalms 110, and Hebrews. And actually, all the first two are all summoned up in Hebrews. So if you want to look up the ones in Genesis, um, when Abraham met with Melchizedek after he defeated those uh, kings that attacked Sodom and Gomorrah and took Lot captive. You can read that yourself. But it is also described in Hebrews. And I want to read Hebrews today. And there's also more information, not only in Cheshire, but there's also some information about Melchizedek um, amongst the... Uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, Qumran Scrolls. And there's one scroll that talks about Melchizedek returning at the end times on the feast of Yom Kippur as judge. And that for me is kind of interesting as well. Because they're all non-biblical, but some people they scream we have one scripture, okay? Matter of fact, it's kind of hard to say about scripture because really the Jews consider um, Torah the main God, God word, God's word. Then they have the prophets who also, of course, prophesied and were personally connected. Sorry, moving over. Personally connected to the Holy Spirit and God. And of course, then they have the historical accounts, which are the King, Samuel, Chronicles. They are all historical accounts. And then they have the, like I said, the prophets, the minor and the major prophets. So and then, of course, the historical books like Esther and Ruth, those are all historical books as well. And there are some, you know, you can say that um, inspirations of um, the Holy Spirit in them. However, there's other books that did not make it into the, can into the canon. And those are Enoch and Jasher and Jubilee. But they were books that were written during Jesus' time as equal to the other historical books. People just don't want to understand that. 
So the canon was put together in about 300, I believe, by Jerome. It may have been because um, even of Constantine's um, doing. And that should tell you something. So the Emperor Constantine. But anyways, those books were put together. I don't know if Jerome even was inspired by the Holy Spirit. But he went by other people. Eusebius, I believe, has already made a list of um, books that were respected during that time um, as inspired. And so that's what he went by. But that's just a short introduction into literature. Or should I say biblical literature, which we have today too when we read it, right? We read books by Christian writers, and we're not making any fuss, fuss, fuss about that one. So, anyways, um, there are outside sources that mention Hebrews, but in general, Hebrew, I mean, um, Melchizedek, but in general, Melchizedek is kind of shrouded in mystery. I don't know why. You can think about it if you do a lot of research, you may come to the conclusion, maybe that, and that's my conclusion, it's not in the Bible, that maybe uh, the uh, Levites, so the priests, the interim priesthood, the Levitic priesthood, did not want anybody to know about the Melchizedek, Melchizedekian priesthood, because they did not want to lose the job. They didn't want to lose the job during Jesus' time, and they killed Jesus because of that reason. So, yeah, it makes sense that maybe they are behind um, shrouding this stuff in mystery or covering up a lot of the information. That's why we did get a lot of, or we got some information in the Dead Sea Scrolls because... Uh, the Essenes, right, they were the rightful, that's what they believed, are a rightful priesthood. And the other ones were the fake priesthood that were in the temple during Jesus' time. You can do some research on that. Very important research. But we're going to go to Melchizedek. Melchizedek is called sometimes Jesus is and that's what Hebrew says. He is Melchizedek. He's in the order of Melchizedek. That's who Jesus is. A priest in the order of Melchizedek. Now, order, does that mean like an organization order or order like um, um, instructions or whatever? I always take order as in an organization. So he was... A priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek stands for, in the Hebrew, king of righteousness. And we read all that when we read Hebrew. But I want to just explain it right now. King of righteousness. And we know who the king of righteousness is. The king of righteousness is Jesus. And, but we then have to account for this guy, Melchizedek, that met Abraham, okay? Who was actually a king of Salem and a priest, a high priest of the Most High, or a priest of the Most High. So then we need to think, okay, how does that connect? Well, it's very simple. I have talked about the patriarchs many times. And I talked very clearly that the patriarchs were the ones before Abraham to proclaim the gospel. They were in charge. They were keepers of this gospel, you know, this is it a mystery, this uh, information that God gave humankind that Messiah 
would come. I have said so many times that the gospel has always been kind of the same. In other words, from the beginning, God said, hey, this Messiah will come. He told that Adam and Eve when he made them clothes or when they killed, he, he killed a lamb and made clothes that covered their uh, nakedness, which is, of course, their sin, their sinfulness. So he made clothes for them to cover blood, right? When you kill a lamb, you have blood. And that was the introduction of Jesus. He also said, the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. So he said that somebody is going to come, the seed is going to come that will destroy Satan and also, of course, atone them. And this is the gospel that was preached all the way, of course, until Jesus came. First, through the patriarchs, then through the Hebrews. And here again, we have the times of the pre-Hebrew time, the Hebrew time, and then the gospel continued mainly through the uh, Gentiles during our time, the past 2,000 years. But the gospel has always been the very same. So then during the time between, of course, Adam and Eve and Abraham, we had the patriarchs. And this Melchizedek that met Abraham was Shem. Now people say, well, where is that in the Bible? Well, you have to think. You have to be able to put one and one together. Okay? Melchizedek was clearly from Salem. Salem is today's Jerusalem. We need to know who was in Salem. You have to do that study yourself. It's, a, it's an extensive study. You have to do it. Um, and if you read everything, you know that um, Shem lived in Salem and he was a priest. He was the priest. Uh, he was a continuation of the patriarchs. He was actually... No, he wasn't the last patriarch, but he was the continuation. He got his priesthood from from Noah, who was also a priest. He continued the um, the gospel, the message from God, and he preached it to the world. But the world rejected it really fast. But Shem continued the gospel, and he continued to preach the gospel even though most of even his children fell away. Now, I don't know what generation um, Abraham was. Uh, um, I don't remember his dad's name, but they were all in the lineage of Shem. They came all out of Shem. And, of course, Abraham's father uh, was a high official um, during the reign of Nimrod, who was this bad guy, right? It's almost like this anti-Christ type figure. Um, and he ruled, really, he ruled, uh, He was a, a really a ruler, uh, a world ruler during that time. And he defeated everybody, and so everybody um, followed him, had to follow him. And of course, Shem um, and many of his descendants like um, Eber, and I don't know what generation that was, the third generation was his grandson. Eber was also a Melchizedek or a, 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 a preserver of this order of the Melchizedek. I may think that this translation um, may have been a little bit wrong when they said he was Melchizedek. I think he was a priest, again, for 
Melchizedek, because we know Melchizedek, king of righteousness, is Jesus. So he was a priest, just like all the other people in before him were priests for Melchizedek to come. Okay? And so Berber, no, well, not Berber, uh, I don't remember what his name is, Eber. Eber was also, of course, this priest. And of course, the priesthood will be given to the next one at their death, at the, the death of the priest. But he was in training. So then the next one in line was Abraham. Why do I say Abraham? Well, Abraham also learned from Shem. When Abraham was born, Nimrod was told that he is going to be a threat to the king. And so he wanted Abraham to be killed. But of course, Abraham's dad didn't allow that. So they sent in many, I don't know if it says in the Bible, you can find, I mean, you can read that yourself. If not, go to Cheshire, uh, Jubilee. Um, he allowed uh, one of his servants' child to be killed instead of Abraham. And he sent Abraham away with his mother. And I think they stayed in the, into a cave until... Abram was old enough, and then Abram was sent to Shem and Eber in order to, for him to be raised there. When he was there, of course, which is the family of Abraham, and when he was there, he learned, of course, about God. So when he came back as a, an adult man to his dad, and he saw the idol's he destroyed the idols. And you can read the whole story. But anyway, this is how Abraham learned about God. And so he was prepared by Eber and by Shem to become a priest of the Most High or of in the order of Melchizedek. Again, there's a combination between king and priest, right? He's a king, king of righteousness, king of peace, but he is also a priest. And can we say he is the priest of the king of righteousness, this whole lineage of priests, are keepers of the secrets, the mystery of God. And again, people say, where's that in the Bible? Well, again, you need to put one and one together. You have to put one and one and together, and you have to pray, and you have to have the Holy Spirit guiding you. That's just bottom line, because we don't have the information. It's a fact when we start reading uh, Hebrew, okay, that there's a connection between this Malkitzedek of Abram's time and Jesus as being a Malkitzedek. So when we see that and we kind of add things together, then we get the right information. Let's start reading, okay? So we're going to start reading in chapter 6 of Hebrew. We have the hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf. He is a forerunner. He is the first one to resurrect. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Okay, so there's first time we hear about the order of Melchizedek. Again, order is it, uh, or you have certain um, standards, 
or is it is it an is it an order like an organization kind of thing? I think it's both. Okay, they had standards, they had a mystery, they had a secret to keep, they had a, a message to proclaim to the world. Um and they all belong to the same order, to the same organization. All these priests became part of that order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek, which is the king of righteousness. This Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of God Most High. So he goes back now to the account of Abraham. When we first heard about Melchizedek. Did he understand it right? Okay, because it's a mystery, and it was a mystery even further back. This Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of God Most High. He met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him. Now we see here that he is a king, he is a priest, he is a human being. Okay, so some people say, oh no, he is not human being, because later on we find something, more information. He's without mother or father or genealogy, right? But obviously, no. This guy that met um, Abraham was a human being. He also ate. Um, could have been an angel. But again, with all my information, I believe that, again, reading Cheshire, that he was Shem. And Abraham knew him because it was his great, 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 great grandfather. So this Melchizedek was king of Salem. Salem is Jerusalem. Salem comes from Shalom. King of peace is what we're going to see in a minute, right? Um, so king of Salem, priest of God most high. He met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him. And he blessed him why? Abram gave him a tenth of everything. He blessed him. In other words, he gave him the blessing. Isn't that what then Abraham did to his son, Isaac, and Isaac to Jacob, and Jacob, who did he give the blessing to? In other words, passing on the right of becoming now the proclaimer of the gospel, or being the priest. That's what blessing, this blessing is doing. It's an anointing, okay? It's a type of anointing that he did. So he blessed, he gave the blessing not to his son Eber or any of the other children, which probably most likely fell away, but he blessed Abraham, okay? Again, blessing is continuing with the heritage of not necessarily the firstborn, but the one who is the most faithful. And this is very important to understand. This blessing was continued to the person that was, was most faithful. That's why it was Isaac and not Ishmael. That's why it was Jacob and not Esau. And maybe that's why it was uh, Joseph and not uh, who was the firstborn of Jacob that was hmm, whoring around with his father's concubine. Who was that one? I don't remember. His firstborn son. But he slept with his Mother's con mother's a maiden and uh, not maid, yeah, maid, and um, not his mother's but his stepmother's, um, Rachel's maiden, and that's why no, he would not get the blessing, and the next two wouldn't get the blessing either. Next two were uh, one of them was Levi, Simeon, Simeon, and Levi. They didn't get the blessing either. And then the blessing, then actually the promise for the Messiah went to Judah. He then was not necessarily blessed, but he would be 
Melchizedek, but he would be promised to bring forth Messiah, which the promise Abraham got from God, that his seed would bring forth Messiah. This Melchizedek, this true Melchizedek. See, Abraham was only the keeper, the priest of the Melchizedek. And so was Shem, only the priest of the Melchizedek. And then Isaac, and then uh, Jacob, and then Joseph. Okay, Joseph, again, was the priest of the Melchizedek. Now, we also know that Benjamin was prepared after Jacob thought that um, Joseph was dead. But it was really Joseph who was then the priest. And then the priesthood was continued, the blessing continued to Ephraim, not um, the firstborn of Joseph, Manasseh, but Ephraim. You can read all this because all this is important. So let's continue to read. Hope we have everything. And then we continue to say, well, it says king, uh, king of righteousness. Melchizedek means king of righteousness. And also king of Salem means king of peace. Shalom means peace, right? Salem comes from that same origin, king of peace. And then in 3 verse 3, we hear something very strange that can throw us off. Without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, resembling the son, resembling the son of God, he remains a priest forever. He is not talking about here this Melchizedek that Abraham met. He's now jumping and making a connection to the eternal Melchizedek, the real true Melchizedek, which is who Jesus, the son of God. He has no father, no mother. Okay, the word, okay, that Melchizedek, the word, because again, Jesus has a genealogy through his mother. Okay, but the word doesn't. So he's making a connection between that true uh, God in the flesh, okay? God in the flesh, who doesn't have mother and father genealogy and he is resembling the Son of God and he remains forever a high priest or a priest. So think of how great he was. Even the patriarch Abram gave him a tenth of the plunder. Again, he is going back the greatness of this patriarch, right? And he was a patriarch himself. However, really the whole thing goes to Jesus because this Melchizedek that was meeting with Abraham was only, only the priest of this true Melchizedek to come. So he says, right, Tenth people that is from the fellow fellow Israelites, even though they are descendants of Abraham. This man, however, did not trace his descendants from Levi. He is making it very clear. He's not tracing his descendancy from Levi. And without doubt, the lesser is blessed by the greater. In one case, the tenth is collected by people who die, but in the other case, by him who is declared to be living. And here's making, again, again a lot of blabber, blabber, um, which we are not too interested in, or well, I am not. One might even say that Levi, who collected the tenth, paid the tenth through Abraham because he was still in the loin. Right? He was still not even born part of Abram. Because when Melchizedek met Abram, Levi was still in the body of his ancestor. But 
Nevertheless, he's saying here the, the Levitical priesthood is nothing. Perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood. And indeed, the law given to the people established that priesthood. Why was there still need for another priesthood to come? One in the order of Melchizedek. It's, okay, why did they have to go switch back? See, the priesthood of Melchizedek was before the Levitical, Levitical priesthood. Okay, not in order of the Aaron. All right, why not? Because the Levitical priesthood, or even the Aaron priesthood, which didn't start until Aaron, was only an interim priesthood. An interim priesthood was only there because they were uh, uh, idol uh, idol worshippers. Okay, and they were kept under the law until who comes? Messiah. This is all the things you can read in the Bible. And if you don't understand everything, and if you don't study and study and study, then the one plus one does not come up to two, or the one plus one plus one does not come up to three. Okay? You will not get it. So you have to grow in the Holy Spirit and you read everything in order to understand what all this means. Because Melchizedek is shrouded in extreme mystery. But nevertheless, this priesthood is, uh, existed from the beginning, proclaiming the gospel of Messiah, of this Melchizedek, until he came. So, not, uh, it says, right, and, and we have said this even more, you know, for it is clear that our Lord descended from Judah in regards to that tribe uh, and in regard to that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. Okay? Why not? Well, because he, did Moses hide the fact that there is a priesthood of Melchizedek? I don't know. But obviously they wanted the Levites, he, Moses, wanted the Levites as priests, and God allowed it, okay? And for some reason, during that time, this priest of, of Melchizedek was really maybe forgotten. During the time in Egypt, maybe this priesthood of Melchizedek was forgotten. All possible. Because so many things were forgotten in Egypt. And we also know that they were worshipping idols during that time. Because they came out and they continued worshipping idols. So something horrible happened during the time in Egypt. It was not a good time. Okay? Not just a good time because they were in slavery, but they were terribly enslaved through sin. Okay, so one who has become a priest not on the basis of a regulation as to his ancestry, but on the basis of the power of an instructable life, indestructible life. For it is declared, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And you can find this in Psalms 110. Okay? For you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So the Melchizedekian priesthood is above the Levitical. Why? Because it was given as a uh, pledge. The former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless. For the law made nothing perfect and a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. And it was not without an oath. Others became priests without any oath. But he became a priest with an oath when God said to him, The Lord has sworn. Again, look it up. And will not change his mind. You are a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Again, Psalms 110. So
So God has, because of this oath, Jesus become the grander of a better covenant. So what covenant are they talking about? They're talking about the new covenant. Will we have to understand that? Yes, people. The new covenant, Jeremiah 31, 31. They knew the new covenant would be coming. They knew the old would be put away. But again, like this secret, this mystery of Melchizedek, they try to hide it. They try to hide it as much as possible. Why? Because they did not want the Levites to lose their job. I mean, they lost it anyways, right? But here what they want to do is institute it again. And it's gone. Because Jesus came. He was the high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Not Levite. The Levites had nothing. Okay? They're lucky they were instituted by Moses as an interim priesthood. And that is kind of shrouded in mystery right there. Why in the world would Moses put away with this priesthood of Melchizedek and institute, you know, a priesthood? Why? Because they were putting up, of course, these, should I say fake sacrifices or whatever. They were fake. They're only symbolic for what is going to come. And they wanted to continue with that priesthood even when Jesus was still here. That's why they killed him. We need to understand these things. Now there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing uh, in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede with them. Such a high priest truly meets our needs, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sin, exalted above the heavens. And like the order, unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints a high priest, men in all their weakness. But the oath, okay, appointing here, the law appoints high priest, men in all their weakness. But the oath, which came after the law, appointed the son who has been made perfect forever. So, people, this is what we need to know which is very, 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 very important. Because if we don't understand this, we will continue to think that the Jews will need their priesthood back. And that is not the truth. We have one high priest, that one high priest came, and he put away with the priesthood of the Levites, the Levitical priesthood. He put away with it. It's not needed anymore. That's why what happened in 70 AD is that the temple was destroyed. Then and there, the abomination of desolation happened. That is written in Daniel. That happened. It ended the old covenant and started the new covenant. Jesus died on the cross, but they continued to to sacrifice in the temple, and they didn't listen. So eventually, God's going to have to had to make an example and had the temple destroyed, so they would realize, wait a minute, things are gone, and this is what we have today, and establishing these old this old order is not helping choose to find Messiah. In the opposite, it will leave them in stuck in the lies. Now, Hebrews is written specifically for the Jews. Um, for them to understand this 
whole thing about Melchizedek. Now, do they talk about that today? Melchizedek, who is Melchizedek? Oh, that's the guy, you know, that met Abraham. No, he is only was only a priest of the Melchizedek. He was only preaching that the Melchizedek will come. That's who that was. And, of course, they didn't understand it. The writer of, of Genesis didn't understand it fully. It's a mystery. It was a mystery. It was a mystery for the longest time. And it wasn't just a mystery, but it was also, I think it was covered. Purposely. Purposely covered. Because the Levites did not want to lose their position. That's what my opinion is, but how else can you explain it? Okay, Why was it covered up? Why was it not? Why did people not write more? Of course, by the time you know most of the Bible was written, um, we only had the Levitical priesthood. And so, uh, like I said, I think this Melchizedekian priesthood was um, really uh, got, forgotten during Egyptian time, during the, the time of slavery. Coming to an end, I hope that was helpful. Please watch my videos. Um that I will put in the description box. They're old ones, so I will still look pretty decent, not as wrinkled. So six years ago, wow. Yeah. Anyways, I wasn't gray. Well, I dyed my hair. So anyways, but definitely not as many wrinkles. But let the Holy Spirit guide you in this all the time. And people, you have to do, if you want to know more information, you can, of course, ask me. I can answer it, I will. But you have to do also your own studies. There are so many studies that you can do.